Uh, we said that last night too, but Brandon, you were just rolling. We're just going to interrupt you, man. That was good. Yeah? But I'm going to share a little bit and, and just spring off of everything you shared last night. I just want to build. And because what you did, what, what Brandon did was lay a foundation of, of just God's purpose in creating man, what he's restoring when he sends his son. We get all off track and think it's all about going to heaven. We think it's just about God meeting our needs instead of transforming our lives and putting his life back inside of us. So this image message is something Holy Spirit taught me when I first got saved. And I was like, you know, nobody ever taught me this. And I went to church. I went to four different churches growing up, but I don't think we were even close to what we heard last night. Like, I don't think nobody understood in any of them churches. They didn't even understand. It was all about, hey, we are the way we are. It's amazing. God considers us. It was almost like the gospel was preached with such a mystery behind it. Like, why does he love us so much? But I guess he does because he sent his son. But we couldn't really get close to him in that in that thought. You know what I mean? And and I don't know about you growing up, but God felt far away. Yeah. Did God feel far yeah, away yeah, some folks yeah. growing up? Like, like, you know he's there. You have this conviction he's there. But you like. <laughs> and it, it's not like that. He wants to be intimate and personal. And so that message is so foundational last night. I just want to talk this morning about how to grow in this truth, how this truth keeps us, how righteousness, he rules his kingdom with a set of righteousness, how it's very, very, very important for all of us if we're going to continue to grow, to continue to see who we are now that Jesus came and how God sees us through his son. Like, you got to put that on and wear it. I, I mean, wear it like a garment. It's called righteousness. So if you have questions while I'm sharing this morning, I think, I don't know if I'll be able to see you that great back, back past the third row. It's just dark back there. So yeah, I'll be able to see that. That's good. That's what I was just going to say. Thanks. No, that was perfect. So I was going to say, if you have a question, at least go like this so I catch movement back there. Because when you did that, I saw that easy. Yeah, but I don't know if I'd catch one of these. <laughs> so make sure I know but I don't mind at all if I'm talking and it has to do with what I'm saying and you have a yeah but like not a, not a bad yeah but just a yeah but what about but how come but I thought just give that answer if we can answer it right because I've learned if people don't have that answer they don't hear anymore come on they're that's stuck good on the yeah but they're stuck on the reasoning like well yeah but I'm not sure about why and how come and you know, and uh, so, so make sure you do that. So, Father, we just thank you today for this time together. We're just looking forward to just continuing to grow in understanding. And, man, I would say most of all, just grow up into you. Grow up into you in all things, not just knowledge, but that our hearts would see that, that we would know you, that this relationship that you paid for would be real for every one of us. That, man, we would never be alone again in our heart, lonely, insecure, worried, afraid, self-conscious. That, that you in this revelation would swallow it all up, God. Everything that we thought might be normal that never produced life, that you would just swallow it all up in understanding today. And I thank you for that grace in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 Go to Colossians chapter, chapter 1 with me. Uh, I want to look at something there. We'll just go from there. See, righteousness, righteousness is, is, is what Jesus rules his kingdom with. First Peter says that we, we have a like precious faith by the righteousness of God that's in Christ Jesus. So we're all supposed to understand the truth of righteousness. We have a like precious faith because of the righteousness of God that came through Jesus Christ. So the way God sees us and he made us right through his son. So we all know we've fallen short. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all missed the mark, right? He that knows to do right and does it to him and his sin. We've all had our consciences violated. We've all had our hearts convicted, true? Yeah. We've all done things that after they were done, we, we thought that wasn't right. And we get convictions. It might not be immediately. It might be even in time. But, but we've all had that experience. Well, what's amazing about righteousness is, see, if God was just a right and wrong God, he, see, he's so beautiful, and he wants us to see people this way. Like, like, if he was just a right and wrong God, when that happens, you'd have nowhere to go. You're just wrong. You'd have to fess up, 
but you'd have to stay marked with what you did. There'd be no chance for change. You'd be remembered for what you did. You'd be judged for what you did. You'd be identified for what you did. Isn't that how man sees man? Like, like you could be growing up in school and some guy, rumor could just go out by, by a, about a guy or a girl and you don't even really know it to be true. But every time you see them or hear their name, what do you think about? Yeah. As soon, as soon as you hear their name, you think about what you heard and it could be five years later. Yeah. You could not see them for 10 years and it's crazy how powerful that thing tries to be on us to stereotype and mark us like a stigma where you'll hear their name and you'll think, and especially if it's something you knew they did, not just a rumor. If it was something you knew they got caught up in or something you knew they did or a story you heard about them, you'd yeah. say, oh yeah, I know them. And you know them for what you heard. And it might not be who they are at all in that moment. It might not have any reflection on the sorrow that was in their heart, the repentance, the change. So, so without righteousness, and I'll, I'll talk about it just a little bit. If it was just a right and wrong setup, God's right, we're wrong. Who knows that technically that's a, there's a truth there. God's right, we're wrong. But God doesn't judge us for being wrong. He judges us in righteousness. And what righteousness does, it looks at you in a way to empower what's wrong, to make it right, to bring change. It gives you the opportunity to change. The righteousness of God is saying, stand before me and be right as if you've never sinned. Watch, even though we all know we have. Yeah. You can see it in Genesis when Abraham messed up with Hagar and produced Ishmael. And, and God said, after it was happened, he said, Abraham, because he had already cut a covenant with him. He already prophesied. He already told him what he had in mind. And who knows, Abraham went a wrong direction. And God said, Abraham, stand before me and be righteous. What's he saying? He said, Abraham, see, this is before the blood. This is before the cross. This is before Jesus, right? This is God's mercy. This is just how God lives. He's saying, here's what he's saying when he says, stand before me, we're righteous. He said, Abraham, stand before me and, 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 and realign yourself to what I told you. Now I'm just going to say for our sake, a couple chapters ago, right? Who knows how long ago it was chronologically for Abraham. But a couple chapters ago, what I told you, you, you know, you, you know, you went into Hagar, you know, you did this. But stand before me as if you've done no wrong. Get back on track and let's get back to what I told you was going to happen. Wow. Let's get back to purpose. Let's get back in this race. Amen. You want to see how real this is? I wasn't even going to do this, but I had you in Colossians. We can always find it again. Go to Romans 4 with me real quick. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is just... This is just crazy good. Okay, this is righteousness. Watch this. Let's just start in verse 16. Therefore, it is of faith, it's Romans 4, verse 16, that it might be a account according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed. He's talking about Abraham. Not only to those who are of the law, well, he's going to hear it, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So he's talking about Abraham. Faith of Abraham, father of us all. So as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, meaning Abraham, dash God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things that do not exist as though they did. So we know the story, Abraham's age, Sarah's age, time going by, God saying you're going to have a child, right? Y'all yeah. know the story, right? So watch, he goes on, the writer, it's Paul, he goes on to write and he says, who contrary, it's all about Abraham, who contrary to hope, in hope, believe. So is there any hope that he can have a child? Oh, no. <laughs> but in hope, against hope, in hope, against hope, in hope, right? He believed because God said it. So he's like, okay, I know what it looks like. I know Sarah, I know her age, I know me. But I know what God said. So in hope against hope, this is what the writers say, and that Abraham did. And he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken, so your descendants, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith. Now watch this. This is Abraham's testimony in Romans. And not being weak in faith, 
He did not consider his own body. It says he did not consider his own body already dead. Now see, a lot of preachers will preach this out because it's such a strong stand of faith when it's written. But watch this. Since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully, fully, this is amazing language, fully convinced that what he uh, had promised, God had promised, he was able to perform. And therefore it was accounted to him as righteousness. When you look at that, you think, that's exactly how I want to live. That's exactly what God's created us to do and be and live. And you're hearing this about Abraham. But when you look in Genesis, he didn't do any of that. This is what people don't understand. In Genesis, in hope against hope, no. Him and Sarah had a conversation. Sarah said, look, we're old. This ain't working. Time's going by. Look at Hagar. She's young. It might work with her. It might not be on your end. It might be on my end, eh? God wants to give you a child. Why don't you go into my maidservant and have a child with her? Perhaps that's how God will fulfill the promise. There was a season Abraham wasn't convinced at all. There was a season he let go. He wavered. Romans says he didn't waver. Romans says that he kept his eyes on, on God. But when you look at Genesis, he produced Ishmael, guys. The testimony of Abraham is what? Fully convinced, persuaded, didn't waver. When you look at Genesis, <laughs> it's a total opposite story concerning Israel. Why is Romans lying? Is Paul misled? Led? No, it's after his repentance. It's after Genesis 17. Stand before me and be righteous. And he said, oh, that Ishmael might stand before you. He said, not a chance. He's the son of your flesh. It's going to be the son of promise. He reiterated what he told him before. Abraham must have said, I get it. I get it. Sorry. I get it now. I get it. And my eyes are on you. That wasn't the answer. I got my eyes on you. I get it. It's repentance. I get it. And he never wavered from that point. And he became persuaded and fully convinced. Guys, all I'm doing is sharing this story. Not to confuse you and think the Bible's contrary. The Bible's not contrary at all. It's the power of righteousness. It's God seeing a man that's wrong, but making him right in his love and mercy. And giving him a chance to stand in everything he said. Even though he wavered in everything he said. To the point that when he does stand and doesn't waver, all God records and remembers through the blood of Jesus is the stand, Hallelujah. not the waver. Wow. Hallelujah. The Bible doesn't mention a word about the waver. Wow. After the blood, Romans, an epistle to the church, a letter to the church, doesn't mention a word about contrary to wow. hope. And Ishmael just says that he was a father of faith and were his sons and were following Father Abraham and his example of faith and then it shares what's he talking about after the repentance after God's righteous judgment see if God was a right and wrong God he'd say Abraham stand before me what do you think you're doing are you kidding me what I ain't good enough to believe so you're just going to trust your own flesh you're going to listen to your wife just like Adam follow the voice of Eve you're going to follow the wife of Sarah, the voice of Sarah and not me Come on, it's a whole different conversation if God's not righteous, there's guilt, there's condemnation, there's shame, there's regret. There's why I have to. Why didn't I listen to her? Now they got issues. Now they're arguing behind the scenes because you're the one that led me astray. You shouldn't even. How come you can't ever trust God? Well, you're the one that listened to me. You didn't echo people. I don't know. This is what happens in people's lives, families, and marriages. When you don't take responsibility, they don't walk in repentance, they don't receive the righteousness of God, and then it becomes he said, she said, and you said, well, I will if you didn't, and I don't know how I'm coming. Now there's stuff in our hearts that ain't good. God is, has a way better answer. Here's Abraham, he knows what he did. And God says, stand before me, watch. When he says, stand before me and be righteous, here's what he's saying. Stand before me as you've never done that. Stand before me as if you've never done it. Just stand before me like you've never done what you've done. Be accepted by me, be loved by me, be forgiven by me. Why? Is God an enabler of sin? Is God just winking an eye and forgetting it? For... 
No, it brings the best out in you. When you know you've done wrong and God says you're more than that. Yes. When you know you've missed it and God says stand before me and be righteous as if you didn't miss it. What's he saying? I know you can be more. Come on. It's you, a Jesus. cheering on. Thank you, Jesus. It's never a judgment. It's righteous judgment. See, right makes you wrong. Righteousness makes wrong things right. Wow. Are you understanding? Yes. And he rules his kingdom with a scepter of righteousness. Wow. The first expression of righteousness you'll see in your Bible is Genesis when Adam and Eve were wearing fig leaves. And he said, woman, what is this you've done? He said, she said it was a serpent. He gave me the, he said, serpent, because of this, boom. Woman, because of this, boom. And he, and he, and he gave a judgment. And he said, and man, because of this, boom, right? And at the end of that, he goes and he takes their fig leaves off that they made. He takes their fig leaves off. So what are they doing? They're self-conscious, they're self-focused, and they're covering themselves. Right? He takes that off. Isn't that amazing? That when sin entered, they were aware of themselves. Wow. Before sin, they didn't even know they were naked. Wow. There was no self-awareness. They're just overwhelmed and aware of God. And they were revealing his glory. There was innocence. There wasn't lust. There wasn't no need. It was just, it was just a beautiful picture. We've grown up in something else, so we can't totally relate to that picture. And I'm not preaching something like when she brought back the rich value man, just call walking around and say, oh, we're just all good now. And just not be covered. Because you don't cause people to stumble. But I'm saying there's a truth there. Before sin, there was no self-awareness. You want to look at it? I want you to look at it. Go to Genesis with me. I want you to see just the peril of this thing. So you know in Genesis 2, the Lord commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden you may eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat for the day you eat it, you shall surely die. Right? So, so the serpent, the serpent in Genesis, in Genesis 3, he was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, and Brandon talked about this stuff last night, I want you to see the effect of what happened here. Of every tree that, that you shall not eat of, of every tree of the garden. And the woman said uh, to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which in the midst of the garden, God said you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Serpent said to the woman, oh, you're not going to die, for God knows. So he implies to know the intention of God. He implies to know the heart of God, the purpose of God. There's a lot of deception going on here. For God knows that in the day you eat, your eyes will be open. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree desire, he talked about desire last night, to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave to her husband and he ate it too. Okay, now watch this. The eyes of both of them were open. It doesn't make you cry if you understand that that's like, that's not a good open. The eyes of both of them were open and they knew that they were naked. What happened? Self-consciousness, self-awareness, self-focus came on the scene through sin. Why? Because they became separate from this relationship they had with God. They got separated from who he is and then who they were apart from him is all they could see instantly. And they were both ashamed. They were naked. They were afraid. Watch this. This is tragic. Watch this. You can see this in today's life. Somebody has a violated guilty conscience. They drift off. They disappear. You don't know where they're doing. Somebody living in secret sin, they change. They, they stop fellowshipping with people. They don't answer certain people's phone calls. They stop praying. They can't even feel like they can face God. Yeah. Who knows this stuff happens yeah. to people? Yeah. Who knows when you're in leadership and people are doing good and they're always around and hey, and all of a sudden you say, man, I ain't heard from or seen so, so and so in four days. That's usually a warning sign. Yeah. 
Wow. Did you know they weren't here last week and I didn't even hear it? And I'm texting them and they didn't even get back to me. Jesus. Who knows if that's about time to go check up on somebody Jesus. because what happened was their eyes got open to themselves through something they did and they're just see, seeing themselves. Whoa. Wow. It's just a good warning signal because it's right here in your, in your Bible. But this is amazing. This is amazing. Look, their eyes were opened and they knew. They knew they were naked. What's the first thing they did? Attempt to cover themselves. They're going to cover themselves. So they're going to cover their own nakedness. It's impossible to cover your own nakedness. Now, now I'm not saying don't wear clothes. What I'm saying is it's not a weird thing. When they're, they're trying to cover their own nakedness, their own self-awareness, self-consciousness. Once that thing's on the scene, it's on the scene. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 16, if you're going to come after me, there's something you got to do first. If you're going to follow me, you got to deny yourself. You got to realize you were made for my image. You were made for my glory. You were made, right? In a certain way, you got to get rid of this self thing that's been on man since that day. <clears throat> Look what self does. Watch. This, this, when you read this, it's like, what? And then you start understanding what born again really means, what coming back to the Father really means, what wearing righteousness really means. You're never naked. You're never ashamed. You're never afraid. How many people in this room you can relate to from little up just struggling with yourself? Self-esteem, self-focus, fear of man, needing attention, needing yeah. support, needing stability, uh, uh, just, just not feeling good about yourself, hoping somebody likes you, wants you, needs you, says something nice about you. I'm not even talking weird relational sexual stuff. I'm talking when you're young, just feeling valued, just needing to be important in somebody's eyes. Yeah. Self, just about me. See, this is a dilemma. We're, we're all born outside of, of, of God. We're, we're born into Adam. We don't have an identity. We lost it. The identity that we were created to have got lost right here. So we're all born into a lost identity. When you're born, you have no idea who you are. I mean, people know your weight, your measurements. They all, woo, taking a thousand pictures in a lot of cases, right? And like, yay, but that person, that little baby has no idea who they are. They're growing up, things are happening, grade school, getting mocked, laughed at, you're faced with choices. You get laughed at in grade school, you're faced with choices. You either, you either, you either break, you get passive, you get introverted, you get hurt, you get broken, you get low esteem. You get jaded and, and, and hard and angry and become a fighter, or you act like you don't care. Right. But no matter how you respond, it ain't the real you. It's just a reaction of survival. It's just however you're forming along the way, because it ain't the great potter that's pat pottering you. It's, it's life and, and your personality. That's why we do personality studies, and they're this type and this type. And this. No, we're all living outside of truth. Like, none of us know who we are. And it's this rat race to survive. At a very young age, you're nothing more than how you responded to what you've been through. Are you with me? Yeah. At a very young age, that's why your story is so prevalent. That's why people always talk about their story. Well, you don't know what happened to me. Well, you know, sometimes it's a justification for your actions. Well, you don't know what I've been through. But see, that's a qualification for whatever you're acting like. That's no answer for change. That's a, just telling people. You're just telling people to try bear with me and understand. Hey, you wouldn't be on my back if you knew what I've been through. Yeah. What they're saying is accept me for who I am. Just accept me for who I am. Because that's the dilemma the whole way up. Just trying to find out who we are and get somebody to just accept me for who I am. But nothing about who you are is the truth. Because you're living without an identity. It was thrown away. Yeah. Yeah. And then we preach the gospel... And make it all about blessing, provision, protection, and getting heaven someday instead of image, transformation, Woo! change, and living from the inside who God is in me. Christ in me, the hope of glory. Living from the inside, clean the inside of the cup, outside will be clean, secure and confident, knowing. Jesus. Yeah? We don't even preach that. We just preach blessing, answer promises, hey, give and it'll come back, catch the bread in the water. And you miss this whole thing. We got the answer right in front of us. It started making you see it way back in Abraham's day. Stand before me and be righteous. Stand before me, son, like you ain't never messed up. And get your eyes back on what I said. Mm. And I'll see you like you never messed 
Wow. If you'll keep your eyes fixed on what I said. And he must have did it. Because Romans talks about it. Did you ever find Sarah in Hebrews on the list of the patriarchs of faith? Last time I looked back here at Miss Sarah, she laughed and lied in the same afternoon in the presence of God. She laughed. And God said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? And she said, I didn't laugh. He said, oh, but you did. <laughs> now that's serious stuff. God said, why did you laugh? She said, I didn't laugh. And God said, oh, but you did. <laughs> who knows that's on you right there? You laugh. <laughs> who, know, who knows that this is a done deal? You can laugh in a secret corner closet. God knows you laugh. He said, why did Sarah laugh? She's back behind the tent listening on Oh, yeah. After all these years, now I'm going to debate service it's going to find pleasure. Yeah, I've heard this before. And God said, why did Sarah laugh? I said, I didn't laugh. I'm not sure it was in person. I think she was behind the, God just knows. Yeah. She said, I didn't laugh. And he said, oh, but she did. You know what Hebrews says? Hebrews has her on the list of the patriarchs of faith. Wow. Why? Because I've learned something over the years. Sometimes you never ever find faith until you have every reason to not believe. You get a diagnosis of cancer, everybody can pray. It's easy to pray. Pray could be just a reaction of desperation. It could be a reaction of fear. Prayer is just a common thing. We just, oh, we gotta pray, we gotta pray. Oh, we gotta pray. No, it ain't you gotta pray, you gotta believe. You gotta believe that God is greater. You gotta believe that you have purpose of a covenant. You have destiny to fulfill. You're not trying to survive. You don't just, oh, we got to pray. No, you got to believe. And sometimes when you believe, you don't even pray. Right. Yeah, that's right. Oh, I've learned this. Paul gets bit by a snake, a viper. It's the third poisonous yeah. family of snakes on the earth. And, and you get bit by a viper and you know it's a viper. Most people are saying, we got to pray. Is that faith when you pray? No, that's fear of the knowledge of what bit you. It's the only reason you're praying. But when you understand the knowledge of what's in you, oh, wow. you don't even pray. Why? Because you have faith. Amen. <laughs> wow. I hope you get that. Paul's in the conversation. He didn't even let the viper ruin his conversation. He toasted the thing in the fire. It bit him. He shook it off in the fire and just kept talking. A little side note on that story. Just the craziness of judging things by outward appearance. The craziness of it. Because when Paul got bit by the snake, he knew he was a prisoner. Then guys on the island knew he was a prisoner. They knew that the Romans were hauling him somewhere and he was a prisoner. And, and, and when the snake bit him, you know what they said? Huh. Yeah, justice found its way. See, didn't get him. Whoa. So the snake did. This man surely must be a murderer or something of the like. They're watching, waiting for him to turn blue and die, waiting for him to shake and go in convulsions, waiting for that thing to hit his brain. They're watching and waiting for that venom to take its course. And they watch him, they watch him. What? That's a viper. It can't last 15, 17 minutes, 20 minutes, a viper. Now a half hour goes by, he's still talking. And you know what they said? What? The gods have come down in the form of men. He went from a murderer, because he got bit by a snake, to a god in the form of a man, because he didn't die when the snake bit him. That's how crazy outward observation is. <laughs> in a half hour, that man went from a murderer who's deserving justice to it must be a god sitting here looking like a man. You see how bizarre outward observation is? <sighs> Get back to this point because man i feel like that that faith and prayer thing that's so good <laughs> i've brought so many christians so many christians pray in fear and they think it's faith because they're quoting scripture the why you're quoting scripture is what determines faith or fear if you're afraid you're gonna die how can you say it's faith you don't fear you don't love your own life unto death jesus is the captain of our salvation hebrews 2 is the end of the fear of the bondage of death which we all our life we're held captive by see but if we don't understand righteousness and don't understand how god sees us and don't understand the covenant we're in then we're just going to try to get something from him instead of become something because of him see 
see, he changes us, people. He doesn't just care for us. He changes us. Hallelujah. If all you think is he cares for us, you're going to weigh your life and wonder if he's caring good enough. But if he changes you, <laughs> Miss Sarah is in the patriarchs of faith. It says that Sarah, how by faith, receives strength to conceive. Well, the last time I looked, she was laughing and lying. <laughs> the writer of Romans don't even think about it. Because at some point, she must have changed her mind and said, Why'd I laugh? Why'd I lie? You get it? God marks her in righteousness. That's why when Abraham believed, it was accounted to him as righteousness. Why? Because until he believed, he can't live in right standing with God. But when he believes, he's walking out everything God promised. So God says your believing is equivalent to being right with me. Amen. Uh, you did it. You see what believing does, people? Yeah. <laughs> it unlocks everything he paid for. He paid for it. We're all going to find out it was true. You can live your whole life and believe you're unworthy, and you're going to find out you were worthy the whole time. Right. You were worthy the whole time. Right. But you didn't put on the garment called righteousness. You didn't put on the robe that he made for you with his own hands. You got dressed by the world. You got dressed by wrong thinking. You got dressed by unbelieving. You wore something that was never made for you. You never looked good in it, but you never took it off. And you'll find one day you had a wardrobe waiting for you with your name on the inseam, named by God. And you never put it on. Believing, it counted to him as righteousness because he had faith. Why? Because he stepped into everything that God had prepared. Until you have faith, you don't step into it, guys. This thing that Brandon preached last night was spot on, crystal clear, perfect. I love listening to Brandon preach. This morning, all we're saying is, look, if you don't put on what he presented last night, then how's it going to benefit you? If you don't wrap faith around what you heard, and you don't realize I was made for a time like this, I was made for the image of God. I was made to house him in his nature. I was made to walk in love, not just need love, be love. I was made to walk in mercy, not just receive mercy, be merciful. I was made not just to be forgiven, but to walk in forgiveness and manifest the nature of God through my life. I am here to manifest him, to reveal him, to make him known through my life. Yeah, not just yeah. receive from him, not just get a blessing from him, get some protection from him. He's not a genie in our little bottle. We're not just wish listening. Come on. We're not discouraged because things ain't going right. He didn't answer my prayer. When people talk like that, they give themselves away that they don't understand covenant at all. They're only in this thing to get something from him instead of become something because of him. Are you with me? Yeah. You all good? Nobody yes. has any questions yet? I don't see them. Ooh, that works. Hey, guys, you have a question? Yeah, shout it out. Now they're Got a mic. Got a mic. Oh, you got a mic? This is what reveals repentance. The fact that the writer in Romans is saying what he's saying, and Abraham went on and had Isaac, and Sarah conceived. So what, what, what Sarah's revealed about in Hebrews is that she must have stopped laughing, right? She stepped past lying, positioned herself, because Hebrews, it gets the scripture, Hebrews says, by faith, Sarah receive strength to conceive. So at some point between laughing and lying, something turned in her heart and she said, I'm done laughing and mocking this promise. God's bigger than my unbelief here. I got Abraham stood before him, said, oh, that Ishmael might stand before you. And he said, not at all. He's the son of your flesh. It'll be the son of promise. And he reiterated the covenant promise and Isaac and told him what was going down. Abraham obviously said, yes, Lord. Because Romans says, that contrary uh, uh, against hope, uh, hope against hope and, and not wavering and fully convinced. So it's revealing Abraham's stand after Ishmael. You follow what we're saying? 
So there's no, no just set scripture. You have to look at the context and realize Abraham changed his mind. Sarah changed her mind and never looked back. Or Romans wouldn't say what it says. It says he never wavered. When I look at Genesis, yes, he did. But Romans is writing about after repentance. How encouraging is this to us? Come on. That regret should never have a voice in our life, right, young lady? Like regret, like you can't change where you've been. You can't change what you've done. Do you agree? But we can change. And our hearts can change. And who can know that this is true? Like there's things now that you're growing and you're learning that if you could go back and do something over, you'd do it different now. That's a sign of repentance. That means watch. You can't go back and change it, but you changed. Yeah. So if I say, listen, if you could go back and do some things different, would you do it now? People go, oh, yeah. They're even dramatic about it. They're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> because I go, that's like, duh. See, that, that's repentance. Repentance is like, duh. What was I thinking? No, we always think repentance is, <laughs> no, repentance can be as simple as, Get out. What? Yeah. And all of a sudden you see what you didn't see. And your heart says yes. And that's going to bring change to your life. Here's the beauty about God. So, so, so her question was, so where does Scripture show the repentance? Scripture shows the repentance by the testimony of Abraham, by the testimony of Sarah, that they weren't left in the place of unbelief. So they weren't good. left in the place of compromise. That actually they were so separated from that place that the writer in the New Testament writes as if they never compromised. Yeah. Writes as if they never wavered. I don't know if you understand how powerful that wow. is. That's called new life to us in the New Covenant. That's new life through Jesus Christ. So is God accommodating sin? Is he soft peddling sin? Is he empowering us to sin? No, he's saying, man, it has nothing to do with who you are. Come out of darkness into the light. Be changed. Repent. Believe. Repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. In other words, don't live this way anymore. You're so much more than that. Yeah? yeah. That's why the Bible says, come out from among them and be ye separate. If you're not careful, you just hear laws. You hear legalism. You hear commandments. You hear like, oh, man, I got to pull it together. I got I to gotta try harder. I got to... No, you got to be better. Yeah. Be his. Be called. Be anointed. Be forgiven. Be loved. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a being gospel. It's not a doing. You're a human being. It's the be attitudes. It's not the do attitudes. It's the be attitudes. It's the attitudes of being. You get it? Yeah. They're attitudes of being. When it becomes who I am, it's the fruit of my life. I don't have to try to bear fruit. An apple tree is not trying to pop an apple onto the branch. You don't see no apple out there going. <laughs> oh, yes, Prince of Glory. <laughs> I know that's weird, but that's what we do. you got to believe before you can bear fruit. You gotta, it's in Ephesians. It's in Ephesians chapter 2. You're his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus. What are you? His workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus. Comma. Then for good works. Which were predestined beforehand that you should walk in them. It was always desired that you walk in them. But you can't just go walk in them to prove you're changed. You've got to be his workmanship. Created in Christ. You've got to realize I was always made for his image. I was always made to be a house in the Lord. I was always made for his nature and his goodness and his loving kindness to be in my heart and flow through me. Wow, I was always made to be your son. I was predestined to be adopted as a son before the foundation of the world. Amen. Yeah, I got to be before I do the good works. So he's the great potter. He's got a tarp over me. It's the born again experience. He's under there working on me in Christ. And he pulls away the tarp. Ta-da! Born again. New creature in Christ. Mm, yeah? Yeah. It's just good. Okay. His workmanship. He's in there working on me. Created in Christ. Then for good works. Wow. What's first? His workmanship. You see how powerful that is? 
So the identity that I receive from him empowers me to live what I live. I'm never under pressure to produce fruit. Why do you bear righteous fruit? Because I'm a righteous tree, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Amen. Why does an apple tree produce an apple? Because it's an apple tree. When was it an apple tree? In the seed of the apple wow. that it grew from <laughs> before it even sprouted. The power of the seed said it was an apple tree before it was even planted. So when were we this in God? Before the foundation of the world, predestined to be his sons and his daughters. God never changed his mind about people, no matter what people have done. On your darkest day, he said, I know who you are. Trouble is, you don't see clear who you are. So if you saw clear who you were, you wouldn't be living what you're living. He says, if you're laboring, if you're heavy laden, come unto me. I'll give you rest. He didn't say, where have you been? What did you do? Well, I can't believe that. He says, no, look, if you're laboring, you're heavy laden, just come unto me. I'll give you rest. You know, the woman at the well, the woman, we talk about her at the school of redemption, uh, so, uh, uh, redemption house, I mean, school of redemption. The redemption house, because they have house people in school, school of redemption. And uh, we talk about the woman at the well. He, he said, you say rightly, you have no husband, for you have five husbands. So we all think of that, we think, oh, this woman. We already marked her. We don't know if she got married when she was 13. We don't know if the first three husbands died and they were 40 years older than her because of their culture. We don't know nothing. We just know we hear five husbands. We go, oh. And you know what we do? And they said, for the woman you're living, or the man you're living with now, the woman ain't even your husband. And they go on talking, and then guess what he says to her? No matter what he told her about husbands, how many husbands, and the man you're living with right now, so you dead smack in the middle of it, girl. Right? He said, if you'd have asked of me, if you'd have asked me, I'd have gave you a drink. He didn't say, I'd have gave you a drink if you didn't have five husbands. I'd have gave you a drink if you wasn't living with a man right now. He said, no matter what you say, for you to ask me, You know what? You would never thirst again. In other words, you will never question who you are. You will know who you are in me. You will find yourself in me, and your identity will be set. So he ain't trying to get her to get away from the man. He wants to give her a drink, because then she'll see, and won't see the need to live anywhere else but in him. If you have asked me for a drink, he didn't say, you ain't getting no drink. He didn't say, you ain't getting no drink. Your story negates you from getting a drink. Your testimony sidelines you from getting a drink. No, he said, girl, if you could just ask me. You know how many people say, well, I just couldn't come to the Lord. I've been down so many wrong roads. I just couldn't come to the Lord. I've done so many bad things. I just... If you'd have asked me, I'd have given you a drink. Ain't nobody loved us like this before. No. That image thing Brian was talking about, the only way we're getting back to it is if you receive this kind of love. Right. The only way you're getting back to it is if you believe. If you yeah. believe your life's not an accident, if you believe you're not a mistake, if you actually believe he loves you and he proved it by the sending of his son, you can't believe your story. You can't believe your actions. You can't believe your crazy wayward seasons. You can't believe all the crazy thinking we had in our heads. Come on, we're living in darkness, living in lies, trained by a lie, homeschooled in the wrong home. Me, myself, and I, it's all about me. Well, you shouldn't. Well, I wouldn't if you didn't. Well, how come? Well, get out of my face. Well, how come you are? You would never do me wrong. Come on. Yeah. We grew up in that craziness. Yeah. When no truth. He said, she said, tit for tat. Well, I wouldn't be this way if you did. Just let people decide who we are. Just let one person, one person, just make you so vile, so mad. Just one person deciding you and how you're doing and who you are. But the one person ain't Jesus. Amen. Just shows how lost we are. You're trying to find a significant person. 
But now that person can break you way quicker than they can make you. Because you're putting all your chips on that one person. You're trying to find yourself through one person, but it's Jesus. You've got to ask him for the drink. We're trying to survive. You say, well, I love you so much. I don't know what I'd do without you. I couldn't live without you. I wouldn't be at ease, sleep, or function without you. We think it's romantic to talk like that to each other. We think that's a compliment. No, it's idolatry. You're actually saying, I'm trying to use you to fulfill what only Jesus can do. And as much as I feel like you're going to make me, you're going to break me if you ever don't fulfill this thing. Which means you're in the relationship for you. See, the difference about a relationship in Christ is it's all for his glory. It's all for his great name. See, there's an honor in the relationship we have now. Self-centeredness is Christ. I'm not a Christian for what I can get from him. I'm a Christian for what I become. For the restoration. Are you all with me? Yes. Come on, this is a big deal. Nobody, when I was young, nobody ever taught me this stuff. They just said I was a sinner. I'm hopefully forgiven, and I better stay in church, and he's coming someday. You better pray this prayer. Oh, and get water baptized. We'll take communion now and then. Wow. Just remember him. Hope we all make it to heaven by the skin of our teeth. So you still live self-conscious, you still live sin-driven, you still live with a guilty conscience, you still live with secrets, and he feels a million miles away, but somehow we are going to rejoice together in heaven forever, and we can barely get through a worship service because we don't understand. Wow. Come on. Wow. <sighs> <laughs> the worship service is never ending. <laughs> Yay. Whoa. Because <laughs> <laughs> you get it now. You don't need no music. Them guys were amazing last night. You don't need no music. The worship service never ends. You worship him when you live in his will. You worship him when you manifest his glory. You worship him when you walk in love. You worship him when you make peace. You worship him when you live by the Spirit. Because you're walking in everything he created, intended, and desired, and everything he paid for to be restored. And you ain't just getting a blessing from God. You're getting his life. You with me? Yes. I got to get back to something. I don't even know what we're doing right now. I have no idea. I should be more prepared. I want you to see this. This tore me up. This tore me up. The eyes of them were opened and they knew they were naked. See, there's a restoration back to innocence that the gospel wants to accomplish. It says in Romans to be excellent. In, 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 uh, in innocent and in, in excellent in what is good and innocent of evil. Excellent in what is good and innocent of evil. So it's that knowledge of good and evil thing trying to get you. And he says, unless you become like little children, children, you'll by no means see the kingdom of God. It means function. It's not talking about going to heaven someday. You will not see the manifestation of the kingdom in your life unless you become like little children. What are little children? He's talking about childishness, he's talking about innocence innocence. There's a certain age of a child that ain't self-conscious at all. Your little girl last night, is that when she walked up here? She don't know she's up front. She don't even, don't even cross her mind that maybe she shouldn't need me doing that. Like adults would think. It's totally beautiful. I love it. Every time I see it, I'm like, Lord, make me like that. Make me like that. Just make me like that. A little child. Not, not self-conscious in the least. It's a very young age you start becoming self-conscious. You start realizing people are looking. You, you and some in innocence, and all of a sudden you realize, oh, they like me, they're looking, oh. You see that in kids as they're growing. But when they're real little, little child, little child. He didn't say child, he said little child. There's an age where there's zero self-awareness, self-consciousness, their eyes aren't open. They don't see themselves. He said, unless you get like that, that's why he said you got to deny yourself. He didn't say pray a prayer to go to heaven. He didn't say if you die tonight and don't know where you're going, raise your hand. He didn't say that, did he? That's like all we say. We make it all about going to heaven. Instead of heaven coming back into us. And us getting new life through Jesus Christ. Right. Yeah? Yeah. Man. Their eyes were open. Now look at this. This is tough. They made coverings for themselves. And they heard, watch, they heard the sound of the Lord walking. Isn't that an amazing day? Can you imagine what they had before this moment? 
Like they just hanging out with God, Father God, Papa God, right? And they hear the sound of the Lord coming, and then like little kids run into him. Just like I saw Eva run into you yesterday. She just blew by everybody, went boom, stuck to you like glue, right? That's the Adam and Eve. Hear the sound of the Lord going, Father. <laughs> right? What happened on this day? This day ain't no different than the rest. They knew it was him. This is a normal day. On the Lord's end. Are you all with me? Yeah. yeah. They heard him coming. And Adam and his wife hid themselves. This is a sad sentence. Hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. You know how many people live in hiding from the presence of the Lord? You know how many people go to church and hide from the presence of the Lord? You know, people get in ministry and hide from the presence of the Lord. They never face the thing that's bothering them, the thing they're condemned by, the thing they've been ashamed of. They never allow righteousness to just take over as if they've never been there, as if they've never done it, as if they've never said it. Guilt, condemnation, and shame are three major tools robbing a whole lot of people from wearing the robe that Jesus paid for. Guilt, condemnation, and shame are never, ever in God's tool belt, ever. Mind. said I did not send my son to condemn you did not send him to condemn you Amen. yeah right then why is it so easy for people to just be condemned because they care on the inside and Satan's afraid of your care so he's trying to pervert it into something that'll never bring life wow. see you can't condemn a person that doesn't care right you can't make somebody feel bad if they're dead inside and don't care. If they're whatever. If they're a true whatever. If they're just numb inside, dead inside, apostate inside. They just don't care. You ain't condemning them. You ain't making them feel guilty. And you ain't shaming them. Because they don't care. You can only make somebody condemned if they're alive inside. And wow. Satan's afraid of that little flicker of alive. And he says, I need to keep this thing harnessed. And keep them in prison keep them condemned and feeling guilty and being ashamed so they can never put on the road that was made for them so they can never walk out righteousness guilt you know what guilt says guilt says i'm not forgiven you know what condemnation says my life's worthy to be judged you know what shame says what i'm ashamed of is still who i am you haven't believed the finished work of christ you haven't taken off your old grave clothes you haven't put on the garments of salvation those things don't fit you. That's why you don't look good when you're wearing them. That's why you're uncomfortable. They're too tight. They're too short. Your colors clash. You would never buy them in the natural and put it on in any outfit you'd ever wear when you really look at what they make you look like. Regret. Second Corinthians 7. Regret is the only way the world knows. It's the world's way of handling things, regretting it produces death. The Christian's answer is true repentance. Duh. Abraham. This kind of has to do with your question, how we know what Abraham had to do. Watch. Duh. Why did I do that with Hagar? Why did I listen to Sarah? Why didn't I stand on the promise? Why did I compromise what my heart knew on the inside? Duh. And as soon as he goes, duh, why did I... God says, I'll see you as if you never did it. Remember I turned you to Colossians chapter 1? You know what it said? It says in verse 20 and 21, it says, You were an enemy and alienated from God by wicked works that were going on in your mind. Thinking for yourself, thinking for, well, judgments, first impressions, figuring out who's who and who's not, who you like, who you don't like. All the stuff that's been trapped in our minds that we've been living from. It's just that wicked way of man living and thinking for himself. It's a pride in it. There's an arrogance in it. It's that wicked way that our minds have functioned. Since we can remember, it says it's an enemy to God. It's separating and alienated from who God is. We were alienated by that thing that was working in our mind. And it says, yet now, yet now, doesn't say we changed says, yet now he reconciled us through the death of his son. In the middle of my mind working like that, God says, you're more than that boy. And I'm going to pay a price to redeem you and get you out of that thing. Pull you out of darkness into the light. Amen. He reconciled me through the body of his death. It says it right in Colossians. You can, you can look there quick. I wanted to 
I wanted to go to, because I wanted you to see, okay, wait a minute. I'm feeling a, a hole here in the Holy Ghost. Watch. Let's do this quick, and then we'll go to Colossians. They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam uh, and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. The Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? That's amazing. Does God know where he is? Yeah. Come on, it's like hide and seek with a little tiny child. They say, they say, they say, Daddy, can we play hide and seek? And you're like, well, there ain't too many places to hide, honey. I don't know where I'm going to hide. Too many. Well, yeah, I'll go first. You can, I just, you can find me. I'll hide. And, you, and, then, and then just stand beside the hut. <laughs> you say, one, two, three, four, I'm coming. Ready or not? They're giggling when you say, I'm coming. <laughs> and you're walking by and you're playing the game. You're like, now, where could she be? You looking and stuff, you open the doors, and they stand there giggling, and you see their whole body. <laughs> Who knows what I'm talking about? That's what this is like. God knows where they're at. He's saying, where are you? He's a father. He's a covenant God. That's why he's there. Amen. He's there like any other day, like nothing happened. He knows what happened. He's got a plan. Lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. But his love is amazing. He said, Adam, where are you? He didn't just show up and say, oh yeah, I figured that. And all of a sudden you're hiding from me. What's that? Come out from that rock, boy. Look, I know what you did. I gave you one commandment. Just one commandment, boy. I gave you, look, I gave you, what did I hold back from you? I gave you everything you're to have. I gave you authority, dominion. I gave you one commandment and you can't do it. Ain't that something? So we grew up knowing that mentality. Because we didn't grow up knowing him. Wow. So then when we hear about him, we think somehow he's that way. But that ain't him. Yeah. Adam, where are you? <laughs> Giving him a chance to just come out and come clean. That would have been interesting to come out and say, Lord, I'm here. Forgive me, man. I, I <clears throat> Listen, I just flat out blew it, man. Adam, where are you? just put your name in there. He's been doing it your whole life. Where are you? Hey, looking for you, love you. Got an answer for you. <coughs> Don't hide from me, love you. It's the gospel. Ah. Where are you? <laughs> it's really good. I'm gonna pull away here so you just get alone. <laughs> this is really good. So I read this stuff when you ain't looking. That's what's wrong with me when you see these things. Because I get this revelation when you ain't looking. And then I believe it. Yeah. And then I live it. And all of a sudden you can't hurt me. You can't offend me. You can't tear me down. You can't chip away at me. Why? Oh, I know who I am and I know why. I didn't wake up for you to love me today. I woke up to be more like him. I woke up to walk in the light of season. I didn't wake up to need you. You can't fail me. I didn't put expectations on you in my subconscious mind. The gospel has established me in truth. And the truth has made me free. And he who the Son has set free, free indeed. Unless I get my eyes off of this thing. But why would I take my eyes off of something? Why would I go back to that tree and rob that? When I just say from a tree that brought eternal life. <gasps> I'm telling you guys, knowing who we are through Jesus is the biggest deal. Knowing who he sees you to be through his son is absolutely huge. There's a whole lot of people trying to put on Christ, meaning blessings, heaven, protection, and wearing the same identity they had before Christ. Still feeling what people said. Still feeling what their actions proclaim. Still feeling what their memory believes. Wow. Instead of taking it all off. Yeah. And putting on something new. Yeah. You say, yeah, but I slept around and I did all this crazy partying. Uh-huh, and you're crying. <laughs> Why are you crying? Because I feel bad. Uh-huh. So is the person I'm talking to the person you're remembering or have you changed on the inside? 
So why don't you let righteousness come on you? Let mercy triumph over judgment. And why don't you just put on Christ and never look back? And instead of being Lot's wife, never making it to your destiny and getting frozen in the path, why don't you become his bride? Do you have a question? So you said uh, a few minutes ago that you can't condemn someone who doesn't care. Right. And that Satan wants to pervert. He wants to pervert care. your caring. He wants to so, steal the life out of you or harness it to where it never produces the kingdom. So the fact that you feel bad on the inside is a formula for repentance. So my, then my question is, how many kids? because they were ashamed, but they felt condemned. So was that then, did God recognize that as like the form of the beginning of their yeah. repentance because they cared? You no, know, your comments, you'll follow me now. I'll finish this. Okay. This is why I didn't, I was going to go to Colossians, but I said, oh, I hear the Holy Ghost yeah. failing me to stay. I'm going to answer it right now. That's wow. great. No, that's an excellent question. Watch this. So the Lord called to Adam and said, where are you? He said, I heard your voice in the garden. Whew. If he'd have heard the sound coming, where is he heading before this all happened? Straight to the sound. If he hears his voice, where is he heading? Straight to the sound. See what sin does? See what a sin consciousness does? See what a sin awareness, a sin identity. You see what he creates? A separation from God. To where you feel like you're disconnected and you can't relate, like you don't belong. Right. You see how deep it is? Uh -huh. You don't belong. It's the peril of sin consciousness. It's why the devil's trying to take the good on the inside of somebody and pervert it so they keep believing the lie. Because 2 Corinthians 7 says if you have godly sorrow, it will lead to repentance. Repentance is a clearing of yourself. It says a vindication. It says an indignation towards the lie. That there's a reverence toward God. That there's fruit that comes through repentance. It's undeniable and powerful. And he's afraid of that fruit because he doesn't want the kingdom established in you. So he's taking the little bit of care you have on the inside in the life. And he's perverting it into something that can never produce the kingdom. But it keeps you in the wrong identity. Even though your heart doesn't want to be there. You believe it's you because you took the test and failed. It's condemnation. I did not come to condemn you. That means I did not come to give you what you deserved or earned. I came to give you what I created you for. I've taken it upon myself. My mercy triumphs over judgment. My goodness will lead you to change. Now where? Yeah? Watch this. Back to your comment. Watch this. So I heard your voice and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Total 180 from the relationship he had. Who can relate to what he just said there in our lives? Who remembers a season where you ran from truth? Where you ran from people that you knew were hungry for God? Right. There was people in my life when I wasn't living Jesus. If I'd have seen them at the gas pump, I'd have lined up yeah. at the gas pump, pumped my gas. Because I didn't want them to come over and ask me how I'm doing. Had I been to church for a while? How's your family? Because I was just going to lie. So I didn't want to see them. Because of what they represented, what they stood for. Because I was conscience violated. You see what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I remember when I got saved, I saw this guy at the gas pump that I would have hid from two days before. I went flying over to his car. Hey, man. He says, whoa, what happened to <laughs> Jesus. I felt like fire breathing. Jesus. <laughs> I was fired up. He cried. He had been praying for me. It was a beautiful testimony. Watch this. Watch this. I hid myself. And he said, oh, this is something. He's always giving you a chance to just come clean. Always giving you a chance to repent. He's always giving you a chance, right? Wow. He's not just calling you out. He's just done dominating. What are you doing over there, boy? You eat the tree? Man, I can't believe it. I give you one commandment and you can't even keep it. Man, you are so against me. I can never trust you again. I give you everything. And then you act like you... Oh, man. Come on, you watch that stuff in a movie and you understand it and it desensitizes us and all of a sudden now we got qualified, qualified, justified, broken trust, memories. Now we're who we are because of men instead of who we are because of him. And now our story is greater than truth. It's not true. 
Y'all with me? What time, man? I don't even see a clock. That's dangerous. What time is it? What time do I got to? Woo! You all right? Yeah. Okay, you sure? Yeah. Okay. So if you have the rocket, I think it's the anointing, but then I think maybe they got to go to the bathroom. So I don't know. All right. Who told you you were naked? It's a question God already knows the answer to. But there's something you'll see here. Adam just couldn't say yes. He said, who told you you were naked? Did you eat the tree? Did you eat from the tree? Which I commanded you that you should not eat. And the man said, the woman who you, this is sad. The woman who you gave me. She gave me of the tree and I ate. So he ended with the answer, I ate. But he couldn't just say he ate. What's he saying? Well, look, I don't know. He's covering himself. I don't know what's going on. But if you wouldn't have gave me the woman, probably wouldn't have ate the tree. Work it out. <laughs> Self-justification, self-defense, self, self, self at the expense of everyone around you, even the Lord. That's the peril and wretchedness of selfishness. It blames everybody but yourself. It takes no responsibility, even if it goes as far as it's God's fault. I'll even play that card if I have to. Well, he didn't answer my prayer. Well, he wasn't there for me. Well, he never. Well, he let him die. Well, he could have stopped the accident. Well, why did he allow? That's a person that has no clue of what the gospel means. They've just been tricked into using God for their sake instead of waking every day, waking up for his name's sake. That's relational. That's powerful. Are you with me? Okay. So let's get to this thing that she was talking about. So the man said, it's the woman. She gave me to eat. Oh my goodness, watch. It gets worse. And God said to the woman, what is this you've done? She didn't just cry and say, you know, I just got so messed up and deceived. I know what you said. And then he started saying, I got confused. And then I looked at it and desire rose up in me. I thought this tree's desirable. And then I gave it to him and he ate too. No. What is this you've done? She said, the serpent, he deceived me and I ate. In other words, the devil made me do it. Well, if it wasn't for him, well, if you knew he was going to deceive me, why'd you leave him on the earth to begin with? Why didn't you just destroy him? Why'd you even let us cross paths? Aren't you sovereign? Aren't you the one that... How come if you knew that Adam was going to eat this tree, why'd you put the stupid tree there? That's what people say. Yeah. And that's just the fall of man, the separation from God. That's just boasting in our ignorance and making humanity greater than God's wisdom. Come on. And now you're building a case against God and your prosecuting attorney, your jury, and your judge. Wow. It's a sign of the fall for sure. Just being mad at God, people, is one of the greatest warning signs you've ever had of the biggest deception of your life. I promise you. And some people think it quick and easy to be mad at God because they're a Christian for him to serve them not transform them. Whoa. He's not here to serve you. He's here to give you his life. Amen. Not meaning serve you like your table waiter. He served you with his life, but he's here to give you his life, not wait your table. Amen. So let me try, I'm still trying to get to this point because it's down here. So I'm going to skip some of this, some of this, because he says to the woman, or he says to the serpent, because you've done this, and then down in 16 to the woman because of this, right? And then to Adam because you this. And I just can skip all this because I'm getting to a point. So Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Also for Adam, here, you can't miss this. It's one little verse just tucked in there. And this is, this is, has to do with your question because this is God teaching us and showing us his mercy triumphs over judgment. So, I 
can't, I can't tell I, I believe there was sorrow in Adam and Eve's heart when they ran and hid, when they're answering. They're just answering in self-centeredness. They're answering in the blight of the fall of man. Who believes that there had to be some sense of duh yeah. in their heart? But regardless, watch this. This is what I wanted you to see when you made that comment. Watch what God did because it's in the beginning. So he's setting a precedent already in Genesis 3. Watch what he did. You can't miss this one little verse. Also for, 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 for who? Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. You can't miss that. Now some people will preach the blood covenant there and it's not wrong. They'll say, wow, them animals had to give up their bodies to give up their skins. They had to give up their lives and shed their blood. So that's the start of there's no permit forgiveness of sin without the shedding. There's no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. So you can teach blood covenant there. But oh, it's the revelation of righteousness. It's the first place you see righteousness in your Bible. Watch. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothed them. What do you have to take off to put the skins on? They're fig leaves. Who made the fig leaves? They did. Why'd they make the fig leaves? To cover their own nakedness. So why'd God do this? Because he just gave them a promise. He, I didn't read it all, but he just said, through the woman's seed, there's one coming trying to crush the head of the enemy, right? Capital S, seed. He makes a promise. He prophesies Jesus in Genesis. And then he takes off their own attempt to cover themselves. Every day they wake up and look at them fig leaves, what are they thinking of? Well, they remember every time they look at them fig leaves. Them fig leaves wear out, they gotta make more. What do they wear out? Now they sitting around, hanging out, half depressed, frustrated, Adam looking over at Eve, she's wearing her little fig leaves. And he's like, girl, look at us. If you wouldn't listen to that stupid snake. Well, if you wouldn't listen to me, you had the word of the Lord. Well, yeah, but you're the one going off and getting deceived. Stupid woman. I'm just telling you, people talk like this to each other. If he leaves the fig leaves on, all they're left with is the peril and the fruit of their sins. The identity of what they've done. And they have no hope of change. What's God do? Takes off their fig leaves. What's he do? With his own hands. He clothes them with animal skins. What you prophesy in appointment? That there's one day I'm going to robe you and clothe you with my own, what was made with my own hands. The body and blood of Jesus Christ. You're going to crush him. He's just going to crush his head. He's going to bruise his heel. Man, he's going to get beat up on the cross. But what comes out of it is this robe. And it's made for you. And it has your little name on the inside. It's beautifully and perfect. And when you put it on, it's who you were always created to be. Right in the sight of God. So when they're wearing the, the robes or the animal skins, what do they think of every day? The hope, the promise, God's still a father. We didn't blow it so bad that it's over. We still have a future. We still have a chance. We still have God. What's he doing? He's changing their identity. He's changing their mentality. He's changing their outlook by changing their clothes. That's why you've got to take off that thing. You got to, there's so much scripture in the New Testament says put off, put on. Put off, put on. You gotta take that thing off. You gotta put off anger, wrath, and malice. You gotta put it off. Why? Never made to fit you. You'll never look good in it. You'll never bear witness of Jesus when you're living in anger. Put it off. Take it off and put on tender mercy, loving kindness. Yeah? Hallelujah. Yeah. You get it? Yeah. So if you would just see dressing, some of us, some of us are our heritage, our our our, our backgrounds, our cultural backgrounds, everything's out for your identity. Everything's trying to identify you. Everything's trying to identify you. Uh, there, there's tragedies. There's tragedies. It's happened to uh, the black generation. It's happened to Native American generation. There's some, there's some human tragedies that there's no answer for but the gospel. And if all we do is keep remembering what men did wrong and then where what they produce by doing wrong. And, and, and I'm not being, I might be crossing lines for some, but bear with me and don't just write me off to hear my heart. So I got some good brothers right here, right? So, but if all they're thinking is history, what happened to us, and that's all they teach their generations, 
They're teaching their generations to wear what they wore because that's what their daddies wore, granddaddies wore, and great granddaddies wore. And it's kind of our way of saying we need agreement, whatever. But you become a product of what happened by putting on the identity. So what generation is going to take off the clothes without dishonoring your forefathers and what they went through? I think we think by taking off the clothes, we're dishonoring what they went through. And we think we have to bear some kind of throne of identity because they went through it. But it doesn't make men's hearts walk in love. It's not showing mercy. It actually makes men's hearts hard and hurt and angry and feel like you still owe us as a generation. And the gospel saying, stop being identified by what men did wrong. I was on an Indian reservation. There was a young Indian lady and she's flourishing in Christ. She's shining. So many of them are depressed and alcohol and have no future because all they're doing is living by the tragic words can't describe the tragic heritage heritage of the, of the Native Americans. There's no, no man. You, you, you can't even hardly. You can, there's no words to address how wrong what happened to some people was. But there's always an answer and it's not soft peddling the tragedy. And I remember being there and all these Native Americans were there. And this girl, I went up to her and I said, look at her. I said, she's one of your own. She was born into this reservation. She was born into this heritage. She was born into this. But she's made some decisions. She's made some decisions. She's got some revelations. She's looking at Christ. She's not just to this. She's not just to this. She's not just thinking about me with fire. I said, no, she's a woman of God, a daughter of the king. She's not. I said, she's kingdom before she's Native American. She's in Christ before she's Native American. She's not wearing the tragedy of what happened to your people. She's wearing the glory of what happened through the sun. So I said, so she's not depressed. She's not on drugs. She's not sleeping around. She's full of life and she's full of life. Because watch, no matter what men did to your people, she's more than that tragedy. She's a woman of God. And I'm going to it out. It's the same for the black generation, I promise. And that might not go well being a white man saying it, but I wish we didn't see so much color and we just heard truth. Because mm. if a black man says what I'm saying, the temptation is, oh, he's one down, he's not a man, yeah, he should he should take your side. I've been around this stuff, I've heard this stuff. So it doesn't matter who says it, we find a way to not hear truth, but truth what makes us free. And if I were you, I wouldn't teach my children the tragedy. I'd teach my children the answer. I wouldn't put something on them that stereotypes them and feels like you're honoring history. I put something on them that changes history. Come on. Amen. Amen. Come on. Right. And only God can work this stuff out. The tragedies and the atrocities that men have committed are too great to be handled among men. But the biggest lie of all. He said it's got to mark a generation for the rest of their existence. That's always got to be the story. It's always got to have to be the reason. And now it's brought up constantly and talked about all the time. And I feel like we're keeping it alive. Yeah. As a society, instead of finding an answer for restoration. Yeah? Yeah. Just a little side thought. God is teaching us. His righteous judgment. What he's saying to Adam and Eve is watch. Look, obviously, I know you ate the tree. I know you just ran and hid from me. But there's no reason to hide from me. I love you. I have a promise. I had a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. He's going to come and turn this thing and make it right because I love you. Now take off them silver fig leaves and wear what I've made for you. I love you, kids. That's God the Father. <laughs> That's something. So he just wants us to come to him. He just wants us to live in repentance. He just wants us to stay sincere. Yeah? yeah. And what happens is, oh, I'll show you. I got a little time, don't I? Okay, let's go to Colossians quick, and then we're going to go to Romans, and then I'll probably be done by then, because you can't get through Romans in a day. <laughs> it's true, eh? Some of this stuff is so chock full. If you take your time, you'll be in it for life. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Oh. Yeah. Question. You woman of God, uh, ask your question. So um, we're hearing so much truth and the identity of Jesus um, and that we are new. Why do people hold on to an identity they, that they may commit a sin and because they have the ability to commit a sin, 
They hold it higher than the identity Christ gives them. And then they live out of the, I'm afraid I'm going to commit a sin, so I'm still a sinner mentality. Right. Is that okay? That, yeah, and that's why we're going to Romans. Ah. To talk about that very thing. No, that's beautiful. She's a teacher, too, so she has a heart for people to get understanding. So while she's sitting here, she's saying, man, what you're saying is great. Let's just nail this down so that they don't believe a lie when there's so much truth right in front of them to put on, right? And some of it's been taught that way. Actually, there's a lot of wrong teaching out there. There's a lot of sin focus, sin consciousness, sin awareness. And it's the total opposite in the kingdom. Everything about the kingdom is put on the answer, put on the finished work, put on the truth. Where would he pay for it? Where would he send? Where would he accomplish what first Peter 2, I'll go to Romans, it'll seal it. But first Peter 2 says, He bore your sin and my sin in his body on a tree. Why? That we, having died to sin. Well, brother, everybody sinned. Everybody's sinning all the time. That's what we say, right? When he says died to sin, what? It's mentality, it's sting, it's memory, it's desire, it's passion. You die to sin. You realize I was never made for me. I was made for your image. You come out of darkness, that place is darkness, you step into the light. Amen. Somehow we just think this is some kind of positional forgiveness, yeah. like out of darkness into light, instead of a real place that I live. It's a real place that I live. I wake up every day accepted in the beloved. I wake up every day clean in the sight. I wake up every day valuable to him, precious to him. Holy Spirit loves me and loves to live in me. I wake up every day and he didn't go nowhere. You get what I'm saying? This thing is true. It's for us and it's for us to live. Not just believe and sing about, to live. It affects us every day. Are you, are you yeah. following what I'm saying? Watch this. Watch this Colossians. See, you were alienated. 21. Enemies. I said 20 and 21. It's 21 and 2. I'm sorry. You're alienated. Your enemies. It's Colossians 1, 21, 22. Watch this. You're alienated, your enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. Doesn't even say you've changed your mind yet. Wow. He's paid a price for you to be reconciled. While we were yet sinners. So what's that mean? How can God not be just waking at sin by doing that? Here's what he's saying. You're so much more than what you understand. You're so much more than the limited thing you see. I know who you really are. I know who you really can be. And I know what you'll look like when I live in you and I'm paying the price to get home. See, Jesus on the cross, what's he say? Forgive them, Father, they know not what he's saying. There's blindness on men. They have no idea who they are, but they're worth every bit of price I'll pay. Isn't that amazing? Who's grown up feeling insignificant? Who's grown up feeling like it doesn't really matter? That their life don't make a difference? Who, who's grown up with a pecking order? High, hot, hot shot, low life. Right? That's, that's in life. That's people. But it ain't true. There's nobody in this building. This isn't motivational speaking. This is gospel. Why? There's nobody in this room that has one ounce less value than another. Some people are being used differently. Some people are asserting their gifts. Some people are actively believing and running the race, and then we put them on a pedestal and think they're more important. But you show me what price was paid that was different for you than me, or you than another. The same price was paid for every person. Amen. Why? Because every person costs the same, because every person has the same value. We can all walk in the light. We can all walk in love. We can all show mercy. We can all make peace. We can all bear witness of his image. And it costs the same price to get everybody bought back. You go into Walmart. You, you, take, the, you take your little thing of shampoo and your favorite little thing. Woo, it's on sale. Woo. And then you go try to buy the TV for the same price. <laughs> Ain't happening. There's a different price tag on the TV. Why? TV costs more. It's got more value than the shampoo. But when I look in the store of humanity, you got the same price tag. You got the same price tag. I look across, you got the same price tag. You cost the blood of Jesus. Why? Because he can live in you. You can shine in his life. You can walk in love. You say, well, I've felt this in all my life. I've felt this and I've felt like I could. And I always felt like is all of your feelings that you acquired along the way through believing in self-conscious, self-focused, repeating the lives and did, history, stories, family stuff. No, no, no. I love you. And I made you to live.
live in you and shine through you. It cost me the same price. It cost every man in a room to pay it. Mm. Wow. Hallelujah. Mm. So you're going to walk in the light as he's in the light. You're going to walk in love just as Jesus loved. As he is, so are we in this world. Hallelujah. They're all scriptures. That's 1 John 4, 17. It's there. 1 John 2 says, if you say you abide in him, you ought to walk even as he walked. Woo! Does he just talk about power and miracles? He's talking about his heart and love. He's talking about his mercy and his loving kindness. The Christ in you is the hope of glory. We learn what glory is. Image. Any manifestation realized, seen attribute of who God is, is the glory of God revealed. The glory of God is when you walk in love. When you're betrayed and you don't live betrayed, when you're done wrong and you don't live done wrong, you're revealing the glory of God. You're showing how mercy triumphs over judgment. And your identity is greater than what a man did because your identity is set on what he did. Yeah. It's the glory of God Yeah. Revealed. Hallelujah. That's good. <laughs> That's why it says he crowned man with glory and honor. Why? Because he crowned him with his image. And his nature. Mm, <sighs> wow. You know what Colossians 3 says? It says, You put off the old man and his deeds, and you put on the new man, who's renewed Ooh. in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Ooh. Ain't nobody ever taught me that going to church. I found that in my bedroom in my Bible. I went bonkers. <laughs> I said, What? I can put on the image? I can wear the nature of God. I can show mercy. I can walk in love. I can make peace. I've been secure. I don't ever have to let sin against me produce sin in me. I can overcome evil with good. I can walk as a light. I don't have to be insecure and take life personal. I can take the gospel personal. Woo! I went bonkers in my bedroom. You just said he was out of his mind. I said, no, I was out of yours. <laughs> <laughs> Don't miss this. He paid the same price for everybody in this room. Yes. That means everybody has the same exact value. You can all walk in the light as he's in the light. Thank you. Jesus. See? Yeah. Can you help me with something quick? What's your name? Adrian. What is it? Adrian. 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 Would you mistake Adrian for Dan if you got to know us and we all came to church together and we all came? Would you say to him, oh, man, I thought you were Dan. I always get you two mixed up. Would you mix us up or don't we look anything alike? So we don't look nothing alike. That's why I called him up here on purpose because we don't look nothing alike. But watch this. Watch this. We can both look just like him. We can both look just like him. And that's what makes us one. Watch this. Rock your arm with me. That's what makes us an army. That's what makes us an army rising up and we can cover the earth with his glory. We can march as an army and be one. And he lives here and I live way over there in Pennsylvania. We don't look nothing alike and you never mistake us, but we can both look like him. That's called the unity of faith. That's called one faith, one mind, one spirit. He wakes up in his little town and he lives for the image of God. I wake up in my little town, I live for the image of God. And God is up to something. There is an army on the earth when we understand. Amen? Amen. Amen. saying is appreciating what it took to get me here and never losing sight of God's mercy forgiveness and justice where some feel like actually the truth about that thing is we all need it forgiven much some people just haven't done the same things as other people have done according to the law we're all guilty we've all sinned right but some people are forgiven much and they know they've run wild they know they've run far left right and then they go, whoa, man, God did what he did to put me here because he never intended me to live here. He always intended me to live here. Right. 
So there's a thankfulness, there's an appreciation for that. You have to understand too, it's a good point you brought up. On a lot of scriptures in the New Testament, he says, and with thanksgiving and giving thanks. He attaches it on the back of scriptures like suffering, adversity, afflictions, and with thanksgiving is tacked on to scriptures. Why? When you lose your thankfulness, you've been tricked into turning to look self-centered, self-focused in how life's affecting you instead of how Christ has changed you. And when you lose your thankfulness, it's a sign of self-centered focus. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. You have a question? I got one question. You want to get that on the tape? He just wants to work out. Yeah? Yeah. What time is it? No, no, I have no time for you. No. The question was, if, uh, because we're in school, and uh, I love what's happening here, the question is, can you help us? I know we're all, and I, I'm just going to speak as if I'm speaking, but uh -huh. that'd be a good way. we're all trying to figure out how to receive what you're telling uh -huh. is already ours. And, and here's the thing, because when you were showing, when you were doing the demonstration of the tree with the apple being squeezed yeah, yeah, out, yeah. you're like, the tree doesn't need to know that it's right. an apple tree, it already is an apple tree. But what I see is that if an apple tree is an apple tree, it's going to produce apples. That's what it's supposed to do. But if you put that tree in a dark closet and then you start it from water and you don't give it sunlight, sure. it can never be an apple tree. And in the uh, absence of light in our lives, we keep hearing it. Can you elaborate right. or help us Understand. how we can get the, what I'm, we need yeah. to get out of that? I'm going to do the same thing I did to her. That's why I'm going to Romans. It's oh, the God. same reason. So good. Where I'm ending. So wouldn't it be fitting to end my session with practical application? How do I become everything that's man is so dark? That was that's that's uh when we were talking about the last session of activation and interaction. You could save it for that. Yeah, if that's you good. To teach more into this. No, no, this is gonna be no, I get it. I appreciate that. Okay. No, it'll still be teaching into this. Okay. But it's practical. <laughs> so it's a great question. I understand that the apple tree and seed, what he said was true, if it's deprived of light, water, etc. But watch this. It's always still a seed, and it always has the potential of being what's in that seed. So that's what I said earlier. You can live in a wrong identity your whole life and find that this was always prepared for you. It was accomplished. It was always your truth. You just never stepped into it. You didn't get the right nutrients. You can give yourself, put yourself in the right places. You follow what I mean? Amen. You can believe one lie your whole life. So and at the end, you'll find you were always created for this. That's what every man is going to find out. Just know that. That's true. But it's right what he said. You could be deprived of things and then you never flourish. But watch this. It can never have the power to change your potential or your identity. This is your created value we're talking about. This is why men are on the earth. Nothing can change the why behind why men are on the earth. In other words, it's something you can always step into. It's something that repentance always provides through the blood of Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. Oh, you're just praising God? Oh, okay. I like that. She was just like up there the whole time. She was just like, I thought, woo, this girl's been in school recently. She's like, <laughs> but that was just a thank you, Jesus. Yeah. yeah. Like, good preaching, brother. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I get it. No. Let me finish this and we're going to Romans because Romans is important because, yeah. You got it. I, I, I just deferred. I said, let me keep preaching. So, so watch this. So, so we're reconciled, even though our minds were alienated with wicked works, verse 21 of Colossians 1. But look at verse 22. Now, this is intimate. Watch. And you've got to believe this. See, it's for the believer. Do you ever notice every promise to the believer? For those that believe, 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 these signs will follow those that. Didn't say attend church, go to all night worship, serve in a ministry. Yeah. <coughs> Believers. Yeah. Watch. I believe he loves me. I believe he created me for this. I believe it was deceived and lived lies. But his grace and mercy is greater than that. And the blood of Jesus speaking better things. I believe every day I can live as if I never did wrong. I can believe I can live apart from a sin consciousness. My war ain't sin. It's the good fight of faith. Continuing wow. to believe what he says about me and who he said I am in him. Uh. I believe. Every promise is to the believer. All this goes to the believer. If you were the enemy, what would you do? Try to interfere with what men see and believe. 
Get them to fight over it. Get them to make sin more important. Get them to get into works. Get them to get condemnation as a valid response. Just try to pervert. Even just implement a piece of truth and then twist the rest. Just try to make it deceitful as you can to keep them from believing the truth. Isn't that what you do? You look how men have struggled. You look how there's so many movements. How many struggles. Look how divided the church is teaching on some of this stuff. There's a pendulum effect. People saying, hey, we're righteous and we're free. It's all by grace. And then people say, I don't know, but you got to earn it and work and you can't just say anything like that. And then the higher this thing goes, then they go even higher. And next thing you know, you got universalism. You got everything's okay. Everybody's just fine. And then you got people saying, no, it ain't fine. And you got Jesus right here in this happy, beautiful middle saying, hey, God. <laughs> Waiting for somebody to land right here. Yeah? Yeah. Watch this. This is intense. He reconciled us where? In the body of his flesh through death. It's pretty intense. Don't get familiar with the story. This is God becoming flesh. That's pretty intense. God put himself in the womb of a woman to come out as a man, incarnate Jesus. With flesh. To fulfill what flesh failed to restore us back to what was intended. He must be pretty serious about this. Yeah. If he put himself in the womb of a woman, he had to hang out on the earth for 30 odd years before he even was announced by John the Baptist. 30 some years. Just hanging out waiting for that death. Living in a body waiting to redeem men. Mm. And then he knows he's going to get rejected. He knows he's going to get back bit and treated wrong. He knows his own people are going to desert him. He knows he's going to have to die. And he trusts God will raise him from the dead. Ain't that something? Mm -hmm. This isn't an Easter Christmas story. This really happened and it's amazing. God's serious about who he created us to be. And the life of Jesus proves it. For God so loved us that he gave his son. It didn't say God was so frustrated at wit's end and disappointed and finally pulled out his ace card. <laughs> so what we got to believe is what God said about us. Yeah. Watch. You'll get it. In the body of his flesh through death to present us uh oh. To present you. Make it personal. It says you. To make you what? Holy. What? Blameless. And? Above reproach. Where? In his sight. Uh-oh. <laughs> in his sight. Right now, if you believe the finished work of Christ, watch. Right now. This is word. This isn't my sermon. This is scripture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're holy. Yeah. Blameless. That means through the blood, God sees you as if you've never sinned. Wonder if you start seeing yourself blameless. Wow. He says, be holy for God is holy. We hear that as works and we say, nobody can do that. I mean, why is God calling me holy? Nobody can be holy. Wonder if you just believe the blood made you holy. Wonder if you actually just believe, because holy actually, holy is set apart, sanctified, set apart. One of the best definitions I've ever found of holy is a cut above. Like, like there's peace, but then God's peace. Mm. There's good, but God is good. Mm. You know what I'm saying? He's holy. Yeah. He's a cut above. He's above. He's a notch above everything. Well, it's way more than a notch. But he's a cut above. Be holy, for I am holy. He just said that he made me holy. wonder if I believe that. wonder if I put on this identity. wonder if I wake up every, every day and just put on believing. I believe I'm accepted. I believe I'm holy. I believe I'm blameless. I believe I'm righteous. I believe I'm above reproach in his sight. Won't my life start living and bearing fruit according to what I believe? Yeah. Here's what we do in the church. Yeah, but brother, it takes a lot of discipline and you got to this and you got to this and you got to this. And we never put on the identity that actually changes us. Yeah. See, if, if, I, if I believe I'm righteous tree, the planting of the Lord, guess what? He's going to be glorified. Why? Because my fruit will be righteous. My fruit will look like him. Why? Because I'm a righteous tree. I know who I am. It's all in identity. This thing is so clear. Okay. 
You said yesterday about the wilderness, and you said how all this glory, all this authority has been given unto me, and I give it to you if you bow down and worship me. You know what happened right before that? Oh my goodness. Go there quick, and then we'll go to Romans. We'll get to Romans. We've got to answer two <laughs> questions. Woo! I think we'll get to Romans. <laughs> no, we'll get to Romans. Oh, there's so much in the Bible. Okay, so Luke 3, Luke 3. Uh-oh, this is amazing. This is amazing. So, so verse 21 of Luke 3. And when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus, Jesus was baptized. And while he prayed, heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove and came upon him. <laughs> and a voice, a voice, whose voice? A voice came from heaven and said, you are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. How do you please God? There's only one way to please God. It's impossible to please God without faith. Mm. Jesus is totally going by faith. He's a man. He's separate from God. He's on the earth in a body. He believes he's going to live this out, die, and be rose from the dead. He's got all his chips on God. And God says, man. You please me. Wow. You're, you're my son, beloved at that, and you please me. He goes into the wilderness. Look, look, it says he's about 30 years of age, and then you got the genealogy of Jesus. Bam. And the next verse says, and Jesus being filled with Holy Spirit. How do we know? He just came upon him in bodily form as a dove. It's the last verse before the genealogy. Uh oh, uh oh. Watch this. <laughs> and he returned. And, and, and from Jordan and was led by the spirit by the spirit into the wilderness being tempted for 40 days by the devil and in those days he ate nothing and afterward when they had ended he was hungry who sees this in your Bible and the devil said to him he just slips in the wilderness he's out there hanging out he says hey he says if you are the son of God command these stones to become bread. So what's he saying? Look, if you're the son of God, just do something about your hunger, bud. Just have to make the power, take these stones, turn them into bread and eat, man. If you're really the son. Jesus' answer is amazing. I sat one day on my bed. I wasn't saved that long. I sat there and I said, I understand the first part of your question or your response, but I don't understand the last part. And it always, we just always quote it because it's in the word. He says, he's on the spiritual thing, man. He, do you understand that, that the Spirit of God led him into the wilderness? The same wilderness the Israelites were in. The same wilderness the Israelites failed terribly in identity. They stayed there 40 years. He went in for 40 days and fulfilled what they failed for 40 years. They wandered and never came out. He came out in the spirit and power. People say, brother, I've been in a wilderness place. Well, I hope it's Jesus' wilderness and not the Israelites. <laughs> wow. The difference between the Israelites and Jesus' wilderness, they went into the same wilderness with the same temptation, but they were thinking for themselves. Jesus was thinking for his name's sake and for the sake of people, meaning the mm. Same wilderness, different perspective, different motive, totally different outcome. Watch. Jesus says to the serpent, he said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. So I get that. He's just not going to turn the stones. He's not going to use some kind of power and pull and feed his hunger. He's walking something out. He's suppressing. And actually, I understand that fasting isn't earning points with God. Fasting is suppressing the carnal nature of man. Fasting is suppressing the human nature of man. Fasting builds a lot of things in your life. It, it builds temperance. It builds. You can. You can. You can. If you live a fasted life, you won't be uncomfortable like people are uncomfortable, even in conditions. We're so conditioned. Heat, air conditioner, soft cushion, bouncy. Ooh, loud. Ooh, ah. Now we're moved and irritated by a lot of things fasting will take all that out of your life wow i'm telling you it will most americans couldn't go to a third world country on a mission trip since they couldn't handle the details fasting will change all that fasting will take complaining out of your life it'll make you okay in the midst of not okay because it suppresses the cry of the flesh. Your flesh is saying, hey, I thought we've been together since the beginning. I thought we're buds. What's up, man? Take care of me, pamper me, feed me, fuel me. Fasting will suppress that and make you very conscious of the spirit of God in you and the spirit that's in you is life. 
Are you with me? Whoa. So he says, man shall not live by bread alone. So I get that. That's a spiritual answer. I totally get it. So you can leave a period there and I got it. But then he says, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. What's that have to do with the temptation of turning the stones into bread? If you're the son of God, what's he challenging? His identity. He's saying, do something to prove who you are. He's saying, I ain't got to do nothing to prove who I am. Because when I holler after my hot water, God said, I'm his son. God said, wow. I'm his son. Yeah, it's okay. And I ain't changing no stones into no bread to prove I'm a son. I'm a son because he said so. Yeah. And I believe it. Hallelujah. You see what the devil's trying to do? Get him into works, wow. get him to prove to where he can maybe take a test and fail. Maybe take his own test that God didn't even give him and fail. Completely find his identity of what God said. Wow. He said, man ain't living by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. So as Jesus is standing there, he knows he's his son in which he's well pleased. And the devil's saying, if you're a son, do something to prove it. He said, ain't got to do nothing. I'm a son because he said so. Wow. You're holy, blameless, and above reproach because he said so. Why? Because the blood speaks better things. He said so. He said you're righteous. He said you're holy. He said you're pure. He said you're forgiven. He said your trespasses won't be held against you. He said he'll remember your lawless deeds no more. He said. Hallelujah. <laughs> you yes. Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds. Jesus is on this thing, man. He says, I know who I am because I know what he said. <laughs> Wow. Let's go to Romans. Oh, so good. Praise the Lord. What time is it? 11.53. Whoa! I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in Romans, this is amazing. We got to get this. We got to get this. At the end of Romans, he's saying sin abounded, so grace abounded much more. And he's ending this chapter, but it's all one, one letter, right? So, so he says... So he says, moreover, law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, so that sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So sin abounded, grace came greater, and where sin reigned in death, even so grace comes to reign through righteousness. You get it? So what's the grace? Grace is God's ability and God's power. Grace is different to God's mercy. God's mercy gives you a chance when you earn no chance, deserve no chance. Mercy says you have a chance. Grace is God's working ability and power to make you into what he paid for. Grace and mercy are two different things. A, a, a husband will say, man, I sure thank God for the grace of God. I really blew up on my wife today, man. I thank God for his grace. No, his grace keeps you from blowing up on your wife. It's his mercy and your wife's. <laughs> Amen. So we just misunderstand some of that stuff. But watch this. So then Paul says, because he says grace might reign through righteousness. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin so grace may abound? He says, certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live in it any longer? See, I wasn't taught that I was dying to sin. In fact, in the church today, we're still boasting in sin, boasting in our ability to sin. We say men are always sinning, sinning while they're breathing, sinning right now. You're always sinning. Don't you tell me you ain't sinning. What are you saying? You're perfect. You're probably sinning already. You probably woke up sinning. You're probably sinning in your mind, sinning in your heart, sinning while you're breathing. That's what people say in the church with leadership badges. Right. But the Bible says that I died to sin. We're trying to get people to heaven. Jesus wants us to die to a false identity. We're trying to give people a passport to heaven. Jesus wants to get a wrong identity off of us so he can put the truth on us so we can live heaven on the earth. Amen. We're just trying to get to heaven. Uh, heaven's been trying to get to us. What shall we say then? Shall we just continue in sin? Oh, well, grace will abound. God understands my dilemma. He still loves me. He said, certainly not. How shall we who die to sin? Practical application. Here's our answers. Listen, we're talking about believing and not believing. So these are your questions. Here's, I'll just, and I'll just now read because I'm out of time soon. Guys, 
we got to reckon ourselves dead to sin. We got to die to sin. We got to say, wow, I was never made for me. In your faith, in your communion time, in your prayer time with the Lord, you got to settle this in your heart. I was never made for me. I was made for his image. I was made for his glory. I was made for his honor. I was made for his great name. You got to believe that. You got to understand you were never made for you. That's why you got to put off yourself. You got to deny yourself. Because you were never made for yourself. You were made for his image. It's the biggest problem on the planet. Every day men are waking up for themselves instead of his image. There's a bigger tragedy. Christians are Christians for themselves. That's why Christians are discouraged, angry, frustrated, living up and down, in for a while and out for a while and in for a while and out for a while. Why? Because they're a Christian for their own sake, not his name's sake. Come on, you've got to get real with your heart. You've got to say, what am I in this thing for? Why am I at this conference? Why do I pray? Why do I read my Bible? Why do I attend church? Why do I serve in ministry? What's making me tick? What's my motive? Am I in this thing for what I get out of it? Or am I in this thing for what I become? Am I in this thing for him? Or am I in this thing for me? So I promise you, if you're in this thing for him, discouragement isn't even in your language. Giving up, drawing back, feeling tired, you don't even know what that means. Why? Because you love not your own life unto death. You denied yourself. You're picking up your cross and you're following him. You don't count your own life dear. You don't judge men according to the flesh. And you live out your faith. So the first practical thing you gotta do, wow. you gotta believe that you were never created for sin. And you gotta believe by faith that you're dying to a sting, identity, memory, and you have to refuse to look back. Don't look back. Paul said, there's one thing, not two, not one of three. There's one thing I do to move forward and reach what lies in front of me. He said, I forget what lies behind. Yes. Why don't you take his advice? We can respect Paul. If there was one thing he did to apprehend, and it was forget what lies behind, then hold on to what lies behind. He ain't going to help me apprehend. I asked the Lord a long time ago. You kind of implied this in your question. Why do we always talk about sin and yesterday and the tragedy and the stuff that happened to me? I asked the Lord on my bed crying over a year ago. I said, Lord, why do people hold on to their story so strong? And, well, I've been through this. You know what it was like when I was growing up? Well, I was here when I was this. Well, when I was five, my daddy. And then when I was 12, my uncle. And then, and boom, 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 boom. And it's like we all just write a book. This is the story of my life. But there's no action, no redemption, no joy in the end. I said, why do people talk about their story so much? He said, it's the only place they've ever found any sense of identity, whether good or bad. It's all they can believe about themselves. Because this is my life. This is what I've been through. This is what it's been like for me. And if you don't have a healthy view of God, you'll even interpret him through the story and wonder where he's been and why he allow and what's he doing. And boy, he's so sure mysterious. I hope he has a better plan than what I'm experiencing. I guess I'll wait till the end and find out what it was all about. But this has been hard. Come on, this is how people talk. You got to put off the old. You got to put on the new. You don't find your identity through your life. You find your identity through his life. And once you get born again, you don't have a yesterday. You have a present and the things to come. I can prove it in scripture several places. You have a present and things to come. You don't have a yesterday. He bought it out. He threw it in a sea called forgetfulness. And he told you, stand before me and be right. And you go ahead and you be a patriarch of faith. And you live by faith. And you put on what Christ paid for. Yeah. yeah. So your practical application in this thing is putting on the right identity. You got to put us. Now I'll read after saying all that because I can get this done by just reading. Watch this. How shall we who died to sin live in any longer? Well, see, most of the church isn't even preaching that that's possible. Right. Come on. It's talking about identity and mentality. You're not waking up waiting to sin. You're waking up righteous. You're waking up his. Wake up and put on Christ every day. Wake up and be right in his sight. Wake up and be holy, blameless, and above reproach. I don't care if you've got to put sticky notes on your mirror in the bathroom and all through your house. Remember who you are. Remember Christ. Hey, you're righteous. I don't care what you got to do. Put a big sign on your ceiling. You open up and see it. Make it all many colors. I don't know. Put flashing lights around it. But get your soul's attention so that you put on Christ and you don't get out of bed in the flesh. Come on. So good. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. And you get to a mirror and now it's between you and your conscience in that mirror. Remember who you are. You can either burp and, and feel frustrated and pass a little gas and rub your hair and say, oh my, and be a ball of flesh. Or you can put on Christ. Or you can say, I can't believe I got to go work already. I didn't even hardly sleep good. And I can't believe I got a long day. This is my 10 hour day. And I didn't even sleep good. God, you need to help me get through this day. And then you call that prayer. Come on. 
I'm not that far off. You know, you look at that mirror and it says, remember who you are. That's where it comes down to it. Are you a believer? Are you going to live by faith? Are you going to live by your feelings, your flesh, frustrations? Are you going to let things matter more than what matters most? Or are you going to put on Christ? And you look in that mirror and the bathroom doors close. It's just you, him, and your own conscience in there. And it don't even matter if the devil's in there. Who is he going to cut off withering branch coming to nothing? Why would you care if he's in there? That's good. Let him watch you believe God if he wants to. <laughs> the Bible says he put a table before you in the presence of your enemies. Amber. He didn't even move them out of the room. He said, if they want to watch her eat, let them watch her eat. So stand in your bathroom and eat. Don't talk to him. Don't make a fuss over him. Don't give him a microphone or he'll manifest. You see what happens when you give people a microphone? They manifest. Don't give him a microphone. You don't need a stage in your life. He's cut off with him branch. Don't talk to him. Your fight's not with him. Your fight is the good fight of faith. Yeah. Believing who God says you are through Jesus Christ. And I understand there's times you've got to move the devil out of the way, but most people focus on him. If we focus more on righteousness than we did on the devil, we'd already become this thing. Come on. So you look at that sign that says, remember who you are. And right there at the bathroom, you didn't even brush your teeth yet. Your hair, hair is all bent. And it don't even look like you got no hope of being presentable in the next 20 minutes. And you don't even think about none of that because you're putting on Christ. Father, I thank you this morning. You love me that I'm blameless in your sight. That I'm accepted. There's not an ounce of insecurity in my life. There's not an ounce of need or lack. Man, I drank that one drink you gave me. I will never thirst again. Yeah. When I thought I was unlovely, you loved me. When I thought I meant nothing, you showed me that I meant everything to you. Your life is in me. Your nature is in me. Your will is in me. Your purpose is in me. I'm ready for this day. I'm going to get cleaned up in about 20 minutes, but I'm telling you right now, no matter what that looks like, I'm ready for this day. There ain't nothing moving me from this place. This is a rock. This is a firm foundation. This is Christ. Thank you for loving me. Amen. I'm telling you, you can believe that thing when nobody's looking. Then you go ahead and do your little clean up. You go on strolling out to work, and you ready to work. See? Now it ain't like, oh man, I gotta work. Yeah? yeah. 